Uh, this is the OGM check-in call on Thursday, December 23rd, 2021. We are right up upon, right upon Christmas. Uh, Hanukkah is behind us. New Year's is still ahead. And 2021 has been, oh, I don't know, <laughs> stressful, weird, exciting, different. Anybody want to... It's it's been a year of flux, Eric. Well put. <laughs> Someone should write a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyone want to put words or, or sentences out for for your feelings about twenty twenty one, positive or negative? Twenty twenty one. Yeah, I think it's been a quickening. Um, all of the all of the. All of the stuff that's going on, um, all of the challenges, all of the, you know, the pandemic, uh, um, climate, uh, political terrorism, uh, all of these things are really starting to quicken in some way, and and they're demanding more attention than ever before. At least that's what I find is true for me. Mm -hmm. I love that. That 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 rings really really well for me as well, Stuart. Thank you. Um, I find that it's a constant reminder that um, that we're living between worlds. That the, you know, the world that was known and taken granted and figured was normal for the last what seventy years is gone. Right. And and we don't know what the fuck is coming. So so there's a, a, a sort of a theory called punctuated equilibrium. It says that complex systems run often in this sort of a normal mode where things are kind of relatively harmonious and then they go into punctuated equilibrium and they emerge a different system. Things, you know, different things happen. And sometimes those are natural biological events like an asteroid strike, <clears throat> but sometimes those are social events like, uh, you know, the, the revolutions of 1948 or, you know, name your other period in human history where lots of change sort of happen in lots of places around the world. And it feels it feels like we are living through one of those right now, right? It, it, it does. I mean, we're gonna, you know, the historians two hundred years from now are gonna look back and point at this time and tell lots of stories about it. Uh, Len Lenin apparently said that there are long periods of time where nothing at all happens, and short periods of time where everything happens at once. Right. And it feels like that, and it feels also like the you know Elizabeth Satoris's image of the chrysalis, um, where you cannot see the structure of caterpillar and you cannot see structure of butterfly you see you know undifferentiated goo with some you know with with code in there that can guide where it emerges we don't know what the code is so i think you're saying that we're in the undifferentiated goo phase right now which seems comforting no it's not okay. well we're you know i don't know i don't know where we are and i don't know if we're early or late or anything but yeah we're any any attempts to figure out what's happening and where we're going are, are pretty much doomed. So, I mean, Flores has been beating on this on us for a couple of years. Like, you know, just give up trying to predict. Predicting the future is worthless. Anticipating, being able to move and navigate and dance with the stuff um, and have some degree of equanimity in the face of the massive uncertainty seems like pretty important skills right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me, the combination of dealing with the world and dealing with, uh, you know, with, with, with chronic illness in the family uh, has just immersed me in that practice of, you know, day at a time, be present, watch the trends, orient, you know, you know, pay attention to what's happening, but not try to prematurely uh, find anything specific in it. Because that's just like, you know, fool's, fool's errand right now. I think that's an angel getting his wings right now. That's what that sounds like. Agree very much with all you said, Gil. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a thought in my brain that says that we are busy involuntarily renegotiating the social contract worldwide. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so for me, the Arab Spring, Occupy, Podemos, uh, na name your brand of, of recent uh, turmoil, including Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and so forth, are like, yeah. hey, situation not right. Uh, yeah. we, need to, we need to fix it. And we don't really know what the fix is yet. Yeah. One other thing I'll add, and thank you for that, Jerry, is uh, uh, someone very dear to me, who I talk with frequently, um, 
I ask her how she's doing, and I'm really struck that her her her, her mood, her emotional set in the world, is very much dependent on the headlines that she read that morning. And so she's just all over the map, you know, days, yeah. are, days are bad, not based on how she is, but based on what the New York Times told her is going on right now. She's being and sort that, of flung up and down. Yeah. And that feels like a really stressful and dangerous way to live in these times. And, um, you know, much more the, you know, if we can find a way to kind of you know, be present and buff it a little bit and just kind of watch these things with fascination and choose where to be that there's you know there, there's some possibility there yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I don't want to go i don't want to go longer but just to remind people that that wonderful old story which depending on who you talk to is you know is indian or sufi or japanese or hasidic or whatever about uh the 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 the, the, the peasant and his horse and some of you know that story and it feels very appropriate for these times uh, you know, yeah is this is this terrible? Is this great? We'll see. We don't know. Um, thanks, Stuart. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I, Klaus. Then Klaus. Then Stuart wanted to jump in earlier. I think too. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I was watching <clears throat> National Geographic yesterday, and and uh, Will, you know, the black actor, um, was uh, had had an episode on hurt behavior. You know, and so he he went through some amazing examples how bees and, and uh, herd animals and fish and so on uh, move around in total unison. And he did a pretty good study on, on how that really works. And that, of course, brought me to, you know, how do we instill herd behavior, uh, meaning, meaning uh, collective action in our own, uh, you know, the animal world here. And then it, it just hit me. We're like totally messed up, right? I mean, we have... Uh, so many conflicting signals uh, hitting hitting uh, everyone. There is <clears throat> there is just no coordination really possible, and a lot of that has to do in the green sphere, you know. Where and I think Sunil made a good point of it, where it's all about you know collaboration and and, co and, and so on. So there, I had a meeting yesterday. I'm working on a national campaign for the Sierra Club you know, to focus on the farm bill. So we set up a communications team. And there are you know, five young ladies, you know, MBA students or just graduated and so on. And my feeling was these are Bambis. <laughs> you know, I'm looking for like some firebrand, right? And and no, it's it's all about you know finding synergy and, and you know the whole the whole hour was spent on how could we possibly work together and 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 uh, align our, our energies here. I'm developing a whole campaign in the process. You know, it, it, it's just so so the the um, the frustration where you on the one hand you have like like minded people who you know sort of want to uh, you know do the right thing and figure out what to do, but are completely unprepared to really engage with the kind of energy and and determination that you need in order to really make a difference. Uh, so, I mean, coming from the corporate world where this kind of unison or collective action is simply enforced, right, and moving full speed into the wrong direction, but uh, we are certainly going to get there fast and efficiently, right? So that, that just hit me like uh, we got an issue here that uh, we somehow need to find out what to, what to do with. Yeah. Love that. Um, Stuart, and then I want to do a little brain sharing. Can, yeah. can I just stop for a moment? Like, I'm sorry, but what Klaus just said came off as so incredibly sexist, and I know it wasn't meant that way, but like, I can't step over that. Don't. Could, you say, Grace, could you say more about yeah. that? What do you he mean? He said, I was sitting here and there were these five young ladies and they were like five Bambies and what I was looking for was a firebrand or a powerhouse. I don't remember exactly what he said. And there was this implication that these young girls couldn't bring the energy. And I'm sure that's not what you meant, but I couldn't step over it because it just, those are the words that came out of your mouth. Well, these, these, these young ladies would be perfectly capable and able to, uh, to do what uh, you know, we, we, we think we all want to do, but the mindset they are embedded within you know, makes that really difficult because 
like in college, you know, today, they, I mean, they, they're, they're being uh, trained to think in circles, to think in, in uh, uh, building up uh, decision making as a, as a cope and so on, which is all good. I mean, I, I'm, I'm totally in favor of all that. But then at some point in time comes an exit to this and you need to, to, you need to make this actionable. And that's missing that off ramp, right? To where okay, we're now moving, and and it's really hard to find uh, how to how to do this because you don't want to alienate them, right? By you know because you have no legitimate uh, authority in the first place, so so you have to bring them along through ideation and and uh, and and you know, uh, bringing bringing the the right ideas in. Now, when you operate in the red and blue zones, there is no issue with that because no one questions the leader, right? It's just it just flows. So that sort of was where I was going with it. Um, okay, thank you for the clarification. I was I was sure that wasn't what you meant, but it just came out that way. Thank you. Um, and Grace, thanks for jumping in with that. And I, I I'll just reflect on my own reactions. Klaus, as you were telling that, I was a little bit distracted, but also. I kind of took it as a gender neutral uh, case where it could have been, it happened to be five young women and it was, I mean, but it could have been a mix of, of genders, it didn't matter. I think you did say girls and my first love many years ago convinced me early on that anyone who can potentially bring a human into earth is no longer a girl, is a young woman. And I don't, I don't use girl unless, unless women care to refer to each other as girl. Uh, for me, it's like, anybody old enough to bear a child and bring a human on earth is a young woman and and so forth so so that i just kind of skipped over that piece of, of how you use the language but thank you 72 year old guy here you know trying to struggle along in a modern world as we as we are i um, actually took it i actually took it as more ageist i was wondering how much <laughs> how much of it had to do with the fact that they were young um a piece of this I thought was a story of an experience and and then a piece of it was of how they were being raised trained what they were absorbing as as how change happens and uh, you know and I think we're sort of all amateur students of change trying to provoke more change right um so yeah that's interesting so everything shows up in the stories um let me do just a moment of uh screen sharing because a couple things uh, first, uh, I'm taking notes for this call, so I found herd behavior, which is under herds and manias, uh, and uh, the wisdom or madness of crowds by Nikki Case, which Eric put in the chat, and things like that, so we can find those later. Uh, but here is, uh, we are involuntarily renegotiating the social contract around the world. <clears throat> uh, so recent protest movements to fix the social contract, and it points up to the Arab Spring, never again, the Gilets Jaunes in France, the Tiananmen protests and crackdown, Trumpism, uh, all those kinds of things. And then, and then there was a note that I didn't really know uh, that probably the most largest and most violent systemic crisis occurred between 1854 and 1871, which was after the revolutions of 1948, <clears throat> which didn't really catch. So there were all kinds of uprisings in 1948 that were mostly, I think, successfully put down. And I think what that winds up happening is, is sort of this, the Taiping Rebe Rebellion, the US Civil War, the Meiji Restoration, the Indian Rebellion, the Sepoy Mutiny, uh, all that kind of site, the stuff, the Gründerzeit in Germany, uh, all of these things happen in, in this other window that I wasn't really aware of. And so, and so it feels a little bit like we're in this kind of, of setting. And um, I've got another, another thought in my brain. Uh, oop, got to spell it right. Uh, lessons of history which basically says uh, <clears throat> that we often pick the wrong examples from history. We often pick the nearest example that feels close, but there's often a better example somewhere else. And I, I'm again, only an amateur historian, but, but back to this notion of uh, punctuated equilibrium, which is right here, which I didn't add to the, to the today's call, but now I have. Uh, so uh, I'm going to connect that to, we are involved, re involuntarily renegotiating the social contract again. Uh, and then, and then one last thing, just while I've got a little bit of brain floor, um, every year uh, I have the year up here on the pin board. So anything I put, I drag up here to the top stays there until I remove it. And then on the bottom, the thoughts are basically just scrolling off to the left as I'm clicking on them. So you'll see a history of what a, a breadcrumb trail of what I was just clicking on down here. So 2021, as events happen during the year, 
I add them to the year so that at the end of the year, where we are now, I can look back and see that uh, Bezos and Branson race one another to travel into space was a thing. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates divorce. Apple says it will scan for child abuse and photos, a major privacy problem. Uh, there are shootings, there's the drought, there are fires. Uh, there are, uh, you know, the Boulder shooting, the cookie apocalypse. I don't remember that so much. Uh, being robo-fired became a thing, movies uh, that show up, and this is just uh, the, the first half, here's the second half, because there's a scroll bar down here, uh, here's the second half, oops, I got a, there's a little bit of brain uh, mousing problem in, going on, there we go, so here's the second half of, the, of this group, uh, Navalny returns to Moscow and is detained on arrival, protests explode across Russia after Navalny's return, all of this happened this year, all this happened this year, uh, and then, of course, uh, don't forget Trump followers storm and occupy the Capitol to start the Boogaloo, um, although the Boogaloo doesn't catch on fire. But I think we're lucky for that. But th this is just that one event in 2021. Uh, and so I'll, I'll come back to us now. But I just wanted to, to refresh in our heads a little bit all the stuff that went down this year. Uh, and sort of to this notion, uh, Stuart, that there's a quickening, that, that, that things are happening. If I look back several years, you'll find that every year is crowded with stuff like this, and you don't remember how much happened in a year, but except it feels like a quickening. It feels like like a lot of the stuff is hotter, the fires are burning brighter, the climate emergencies are, are you know, the climate uh, extremes are, are, are being hit. Um, it's all, it's all difficult. Um, Sorry to kill off conversation like that, but um, anyone have any reflections just on, on uh, 2021 and then we'll go into um, a round of check-ins. Yeah, just quick, just quickly. Um, it's quickening because I think we're, we're, the world is so much smaller, seems so much smaller at this point in time because of the connectivity and because uh, many of the phenomenon that we're talking about have planetary um, consequences, or at least that's the way it seems. What's critical, I think, is, is, is to realize in terms of personal ecology, if you're feeling you know, pulled and twisted in both ways, it's because we're both in a bardo and a birding channel at the same, at the, at the same exact time. Um, and, and so two of the, two of the things that, that have been kind of sustaining me in some ways are um, this notion of the, the Buddhist notion of totally not being attached to outcome. I'm more engaged and more active and busier, but I'm not attached to, 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 to any particular kind of end result. It doesn't mean that I, I, I'm, I'm less in my um, engagement. And, and the other piece, and this is this was the title of Meg Wheatley's last book, um, and I know many people think she's gone over the edge, but she really hasn't. Uh, the title of the book is, Who Do You Choose to Be? And I think that's a wonderful phrase to ask yourself every morning uh, when you wake up and, and enter your day. Who are you going to be today? And how are you going to, in some ways, make a contribution to the world? I was in a workshop that Meg did a couple of weeks ago uh, on this theme. And I don't know about who's saying she's going over the deep end. But what it seems like she's doing is focusing on being of service to activists and change agents who are engaging this quickening time from a much Buddhist perspective, as, as Stuart, you summarized, uh, and felt pretty rich to me. Yeah, I've been, I've been working with Meg for the last almost seven years in the Warriors for the Human Spirit program, and it's provided a, a wonderful ground. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, and also, um, I, for the exigencies of house move today and the need to go pick up a U-Haul, I need to drop off the call at 845 Pacific this morning. So I'm uh, hoping that Ken or Gil or somebody would pick up and host and continue. Uh, Doug, if you'd like to. Uh, oh, yeah. do you just want to jump into the conversation? Well, I want to jump into the conversation. Let's do that. <laughs> um, what I noticed about this last year is where I feel like I am is more in a kind of floating internet space that pervades everything, whether it's the banks, whether it's money, whether it's whatever. Whereas I used to live in a combination of city and nature. And being in that place is gone. Uh, the, the environment feels all pervasive. You can't escape it. It's like a kind of goo. Um, and it just affects everything. 
And I'm trying to be kind of poetic here, but I'm not quite making it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the internet's reach, the, the long reach of the internet <laughs> is now everywhere. Our lives are pervaded by it. And it's, and it's not impossible to step away, uh, but you have to practice stepping away. You have to make it a you have to make it a conscious practice. Go ahead. Well, it's not just the internet. It's it's a uh, it's finance reaches everything. Uh, market uh, the crazy thing we call free market is feels much more pervasive uh, than it used to. It used to be that you could step out of it. And that I think is the playing out of the current narrative because neoliberal consumer focused mass market capitalism will touch and eat everything. It will make a market for everything it possibly can and we've been allowing it to. And so part of the renegotiation of the social contract I think is an objection to that in many places. You know, and you saw it in Bolivia when water, all water got privatized and that turned into huge protests but that was already more than a decade ago. Right. So, so, so um, I'm hoping that the trend you just described, Doug, isn't the inevitable future and that we're just going to get worse in there. I'm hoping that there are some resets available in our future where we figure out a better balance instead. Gil, go ahead. It's not the inevitable future, but it's the looming future for sure. And it's not just, Doug, what you're talking about. It's also the urbanization. Uh, you know, on a planet where more than 50% of us are urban and that number is going up, the contact with nature as we traditionally think of it, becomes scarce and scarce. So yeah, we're immersed in that world. Uh, and the connect with the living world seems to be fundamental to me. I've been talking less about um, us and corporations and policy and so forth, being kinder to nature or balancing nature, managing nature better, et cetera, and thinking about what does it mean to belong to nature? What would we do? How do we do business if we belong to nature and the possibility of that experience is becoming further and further away, given the trends that you're talking about and the others. Yeah. Or it's and coming closer and closer and we just don't realize it's happening in a crash. Well, it's happening in the crash and you know, here we are, you know, the prosperity of the last hundred years is built on a decimation of living systems, you know, accelerated deforestation, decline of ocean health, decline of soils, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this house of cards. And so it's there, it will bite us, but we're living as if not. To Doug's point, more, we're living more and more as if not, as if we're in something separate from that. Uh, when we are still, last time I checked, you know, biological critters. And Klaus put in the chat a video I have not seen yet about collapse, the only realistic scenario. Just like, whoa. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this is actually a really good uh, um, statistical uh, description of where we're heading. And the point is, there was a conversation I had with Sunil <clears throat> that you know, played out on LinkedIn. The, the, the point this guy is making, basically, we have passed uh, uh, tipping points. You know, the Arctic ice has shrunk to the point where it no longer supports the jet stream. You can't put that ice back on there. It's, it's gone, right? So the, the reason why we have these weather systems floating around, wild and clashing, is because the jet stream no longer regulates uh, the... the, the uh, these, whether these climate systems moving north to south and south to north is like a rubber band that was laying across the North American continent. So yet that ice is gone. So the argument this guy is making is our choice right now is to have a steep down curve, you know, or to have a feathered curve. So the, the only thing we can still do is through intervention cushion the worst impacts of what is going to happen here. It's going to happen. It's inevitable at this point. Now, so, I mean, this is why focus on agriculture is so important, focus on the food supply, you know, focus on environment, restoration of ecosystems and so on. That's where the action really has to be. Now, and so, yeah, I mean, it's really concerning what Dr. and Gil are saying here because that's also my experience. We're living in this pseudo world. I was sitting in a coffee shop with my wife yesterday and you look at all, everything is like normal around you, right? And you know deep down it's not. You know, so, and that's also that what disturbed me. So in this meeting, even the Sierra Club, right? Where we are talking about environment and nature and all this stuff. Even there, that sense of urgency that we should be feeling at this point simply isn't there, right? So, so how do you get to that point uh, when you are moving against a media, which is, which is, you know, the, I mean, 
90% of US media is, is owned and controlled by nine corporate uh, entities, right? I mean, by, so by six corporate entities, six corporations own 90% of the US media. And they, have, they haven't decided yet that we need to shift course. They don't want to shift course. I see it you know, in, the, in the food business, in the agricultural business. So the, and so the longer we drift you know, on this course, the steeper this curve gets. And this is really a good video to watch in, in very simple terms to uh, explaining that. Thanks, Hans. Um, and societies are really, really hard to turn, extremely hard to turn. And mostly, mostly they turn when forced to, and that's either through being overtaken by a different society or destroying themselves. Um, and I'd love us to ponder a little bit about societies that have successfully navigated very difficult change over time, because I think there aren't that many that have survived as roughly the same society, except in very different circumstances. Now, you could say that Aboriginal Australians <clears throat> have preserved a culture for possibly as long as 60,000 years, probably 35,000. Um, and that's, a, that's an extremely, extremely long time when you think of generations. That's, that's, that's durability, right? Uh, and there, there, are, there are multiple hundreds of, of cultures and languages among them, uh, yet extremely common ways of sort of seeing and doing. Uh, it's, it's super interesting. And there's a whole bunch more there about how they had, you know, before the Europeans show up, they'd figured out a whole bunch of good stuff, um, which the Europeans only saw as savage, primitive, and useless, which is, hey, par for the course for Europe. Um, so why don't we, uh, we've, we've almost gone through a half hour, why don't we do a little bit of check-in, just uh, in the, since this is one of our check-in calls, not our topic calls, and I kind of spun us up on 2021, and it's not the last call of the year, I think next week's will be. Um, so uh, uh, why don't we go um, Grace Doug Kim. If you're still listening, Grace. Or if you can seize the unmute button, uh, let's wait until Grace is back. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm. I, I would rather go later because I'm still not quite in a place where I can sit down. That sounds great. No worries. Uh, let's go, Doug Ken Klaus. Well, the key thing that's on my mind is I finished a draft of this book called Garden World Politics, which has the view that. Uh, to try to change to a better society from a fairly reasonable one, fairly reasonable, uh, doesn't work very well. Things have to collapse in order to reconfigure. Uh, so even if we had a modernist future scenario, uh, we can't get there without some breakdown first. Uh, now, whether we can come out of the breakdown is a real question. Uh, I think with what Klaus is doing, I think is really important with agriculture. My view is that we need to mix habitat in with agriculture uh, for a sustainable short-term future after the collapse begins. So anyway, uh, my plea is I'm looking for an agent for the book. So if anybody has any idea of an agent who might be willing to pick it up, I'd be delighted. Super, thank you. Anybody with ideas for agents, um, please contact Doug. Um, and I'll pick up on a piece of what you said, which is that I think Steve Bannon, for example, is trying to force that breakdown. And there's a whole bunch of people who are like, oh, okay, if systems only change when they're under such stress that they crack and break, let's go crack and break this one faster. And there's a, there's a reasonable, reasoned argument to make that that's a strategy and that there's a whole bunch of people who've adopted that strategy right now and who will be extremely hard to convince to pull back and try to mitigate adapt, adopt, change, do other kinds of things. And, the, yep. the sec, and I'll throw a second thing in, which is Jem Bendel is one of many, uh, several people who, who said, hey, uh, shit is so broken that we're going to have to do deep adaptation. Forget, forget small adaptive behaviors. We need to figure out how to actually survive when this thing uh, is really broken. Uh, so there's, there's lots of kind of approaches to that. Um, let's go Ken Klaus. Hello, everybody. Um, sitting here on a very rainy uh, morning in San Rafael. Our reservoirs are up to 
and just mm -hmm. a month ago they were they were at 31 percent. so we've had a really major reversal here and breathing a lot easier i'm uh, very grateful for the for the rain and uh so that's that's news number one um well i came in feeling really good and listening to this is like oh, just a reminder of how bad things are you know i'm sorry and, no, 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 it's not a problem. It's, it's, I have a, a meme of, of a metronome, right? And on one side of the metronome, it's like, everything is great. And the other is like, we're so fucked. And that's how I feel like I live my days between everything is great and we're so fucked. Um, and, and trying to find the middle ground uh, of being in that bardo and, and finding a, a way to um, maintain some sense of, of equanimity in the midst of all this. Um, I was talking to Doug a, a while ago and, um, you know, I said, how are you doing? He says, you know, I find myself giggling sometimes. My life is actually pretty good despite all the challenge that's going on. And and I find myself in the same position at the moment. Um, you know, I just completed this this six month um, inclusion process. I just got booked for some work in New York City, which makes me a little bit of uh, trepidation of flying, um, but it's a very well paid gig. And um, it's from the company that's, they've sent me their second gig now this year, which is unusual because it's usually once a year and it seems like they're heating up. So, um, Lots of good stuff happening in my life that I'm I'm pleased about, and um, trying to to use that as much as possible to keep me sane when I confront what's going on in the world. And um, I, I want to ask Klaus a question. Uh, in that uh, special on herd behavior, did they talk about eyes? Because it seems to me that animals that ex exhibit herd behavior have eyes on the sides of their head, not stereoscopic vision. And I'm wondering how that changes the perception of knowing you're, you see everybody around you and we don't, we just see what's in front of us unless we turn and look. I think there's something about peripheral vision and, and, and herd behavior. Did they mention anything like that? Yeah, the, 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 the conclusion was that um, if, if just one or two or three members of the herd, whether it's fish or birds or, or, or a herd of, of uh, animals, uh, then nothing happens. But the moment that you have a mass movement, the moment that uh, basically what they were saying, everybody walks next to each other, not too close and not too far, but they're, they're just in the right distance. And um, if your neighbor moves, you move. Mm -hmm. right? so, so there is this, this instinct, your neighbor moves left, you move left. And so there is astonishing split second reaction you know, in, in, in the way that these swarms uh, behave. Um, and so I don't know, it didn't say anything about eyes because then also you have, let's say wolves or predators who are working in packs, right? And they are totally coordinated and they of course have this slim. So I'm not sure that it has anything to do with vision. So, so two things on that. One, the closest I've ever come to experiencing herd behavior is driving a car in Buenos Aires. And if anybody who's driven in Rome or BA knows, <clears throat> like the lines on the pavement mean pretty much nothing. If everybody's wandering around, it's like a ballet. But if you turn a little too sharply, you'll get honked at and everybody around you is like, what the hell? And so, so there's, there's a known behavior where it's perfectly legitimate to just wander across and you know, cut through lanes. People squeeze between cars when, when, this, when there's a stoplight. Most, most people stop, but then you, it's perfectly legit to squeeze your, your, the hood of your car between the other two cars. No big deal. Nobody, nobody will get cranky at you until you behave out of the norm of the herd, of the crowd, of the group, of the flock of cars that's moving down the street. And it's really kind of beautiful once you're sort of integrated. You do have to keep your eye on all the mirrors and know what the hell is going on around you. You have to be very vigilant. Second thing I'll say is I did a like a the Ziba where I have a desk uh, invited me along to a little bit of leadership training with a woman who uh, uses horses to teach people about leadership and so forth. And horses are exquisitely sensitive. They are insanely sensitive. They are also apparently are matri uh, matriarchal in their organization. <laughs> so a horse herd is paying attention to breath, uh, to a whole bunch of other cues besides the visual field. And so if the if the if the lead horse changes her breathing and looks up, everybody will stop and look up. Like, like, like uh, the, the, there's, there's a whole bunch of other cues going on. Elephants communicate through subtle vibrations in the earth sometimes. I think there's, there's multi-sensory fusion happening that allows these herds to feel uh, where they are and where they, you know, and, and how they are together. And then that, that, that just right spacing is like what happens when you're part of that particular kind of herd with those dynamics, right? And the just right spacing for a herd of minnow, for a, a school of minnows is different from a flock of starlings uh, or a murder of crows 
or uh, you know a herd of elephants. But 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 all these things are kind of exquisitely tuned over time, and we are busy being divided up into little rectangles in Zoom and missing our in-person herd behavior. And like, like a whole bunch of stuff is busy up in the air. And are, are we supposed to be like in 3D avatars in the metaverse? And I think, I think so much of this for humans is just under like involuntary renegotiation. It's like, wait, wait, I'd like to, like Doug said earlier, I'd love to be in nature and, and figure things out. Uh, you know, I, I used to live kind of in nature and happen to be online, but there we go. Go ahead, Gil. The bandwidth of this thing is infinitesimal compared to what what passes between people in real life and physical presence. You know, with these little squares. I mean, you know, we, we, we have pheromones, we have sounds, we have body movement. Uh, anybody ever have, have the sensation of feeling that somebody was looking at you and you turn around and there they are. There's, I mean, you know, there's, there's other senses that we have besides this uh, and we we forget we lose them uh, we lose them in cities we lose them here but they're there and that's some of what the you know you talked about the 60,000 year aboriginal cultures that's some of what's operative in that universe you all get a haptic body suit and we are coded for what the coder th is thinks about putting in there and not what he or she doesn't think about right um, let's go Klaus, Stuart, Stacy, Eric. Yeah, um, I mean, picking up on herd behavior, of course, we are totally wired to act uh, uh, as a herd. Um, and it's, it's unfortunately really well uh, framed in the red and, in, 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 uh, blue zones of the, you know, of the spiral dynamic uh, field. Um, because there, you know, you, you suspend disbelief. You do, there is just no no critical challenge, you know, to to what the leader is saying. Um, but we we haven't figured out how to establish this in the green zone, you know. And so, but that's where we need to move through to get to teal, and that's where the challenge is. So, what my my thinking is, we need to merge orange and and yellow. I mean, orange and green to get to teal. Now, you need to have the practicality with the techno focus and all of this of orange blended in with a green mindset, hopefully to get there. But to what, what Doug was saying, um, when you look at the history of civilizations that collapsed, uh, some recovered, some didn't, right? Uh, the, Roman, the Roman Empire just transitioned from, from a the emperor to a, to a theocracy and persisted another thousand years. I mean, when you look at the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, you know, through uh, until the 19th century, really, it's just astounding. But then a lot of them just didn't come back. And my argument right now here is we're not going to come back because a collapse would destroy the industrial capacity that we need, the infrastructure that we need to, to move forward, you know, to recover. And so we can't afford to break anything because we need everything to make it through. You know? And so the, 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 the only way to, the, the, to really do this is to move from the bottom up, provide people with access to, to food and shelter, basic stuff, let them take care of themselves, you know, uh, empower people to, to, to help themselves and to, to secure their own instant, immediate surrounding. Uh, and so that's hopefully um, something, and, and there, there is a big regenerative movement, you know, that is focused in my mind too much on the technical aspect of shifting, you know, into regenerative practices, but not shifting the, the social minds, you know, the hive into why this is important and why we need to do this. So I think that's the 2022 challenge, you know, the learnings of 2021. Thanks, Klaus. Um, let's go Stuart, Stacy, Eric, and then Grace. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I was feeling pretty good about, about my life 
<laughs> before this call and, and all of a sudden I'm realizing the incredible level of complexity that we're in. You know, when Klaus just talked about, you know, destruction of the industrial base, I started to think about how people are all concentrated in cities and this notion of, you know, the back to the land movement, the incredible discontinuity that that was going to provide, you know, when you impose climate on that, Boy, you wanted a you wanted a, a a human experience. What a time to be on the planet! What a time to be on the planet to be to, to be having an embodied experience of 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 some kind. Um, so, by way of check in, I will publish um, a huge book of poetry that's been a twenty year project this year. Um, every year, I think it's done after editing one poem a day. But this is it. It's it's you know it it's time to deliver this thing you know and be done with it at the end of September or if not if not sooner. Um, I decided to 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 just start. You know, people talked about a little bit earlier in the call about how the capitalist mentality in in some ways you know can have a negative impact on so many different things. So that being said, I've got some e-learning courses on collaboration and conflict resolution that I'm gonna to start to give away to, to certain communities. I haven't figured out the exact structure of that, but I think that the tools there will allow people to communicate with each other and collaborate with each other kind of um, effectively. Um, you know, the great news is that this, um, personal relationship that I started in, in August of the pandemic, August 19, August of 2020 continues. It's like, you know, 16 months and it's kind of like, oh my God, what, a, what an amazing blessing during the, during the pandemic. So, um, you know, one day at a time, one step, one foot in front of another, you know, Gil, you mentioned earlier about dealing with, you know, taking care of personal illness. I mean, I was a caregiver for a number of years with my, with my, my late wife. And um, it was one of the greatest lessons of, of, of being human. Uh, I, I so appreciate this call because about six months ago, I decided I only wanted to be in conversations like this. And this is one of the conversations that I just jumped into. So I appreciate all of you and the, the expansiveness of your thinking and views and awareness and knowledge. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I love that. Um, I'm gonna have to bounce off the call in a minute or two here. Uh, I'll pass the con to Ken uh, for, the, for the rest of the, the call. Uh, and we have Stacy Eric Grace, and I will uh, slip off probably in a minute or two, but please go ahead. Well, Stuart, I share your sentiments about only wanting to be in certain kinds of conversations. And Jerry, you started off asking what 2020 was like for each one of us. So for me, 2021 was about um, really learning how to stay in the eye of the storm. And uh, I feel pretty stable there, but when you, you said um, something about systems having to like explode some, before they rebuild and it just, it made me gasp because I think of every human being as a system and I'm looking at so many really traumatized people. And I do believe that this is a period where things are coming up for them and they're breaking. And I, I am hopeful that we can reconfigure in better ways. And I just, for my part, you know, I think about any tragedy that I've ever experienced, the most important thing was who was around me. And I think that if um, you know, I can be the best me and walk through and emanate that to other people, and they can do the same. I think that's you know that's something that keeps me hopeful. I'm complete. Uh, Jerry jumped off. I was just going to say goodbye. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody knows, but Jerry in April just bought a, a new condo. So if you saw it on Facebook. He's uh, moving today. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, let's see, we had uh, next up is Eric and then Grace. Yeah, hi everybody. So um, yeah, I had a pretty good week. Um, Mark Carranza 
uh, sent out the invitation to his San Francisco Memex mm -hmm. meeting, and I enjoyed that, uh, seeing uh, how people think and uh, what's going on there. Um, I also was able to connect with Marc Antoine, and uh, we shared ideas together, so we'll see what kind of synergy comes out of that. And I sent uh, Jerry a video by Jaron Lanier, who's an mm -hmm. early VR guy who um, did a talk at uh, the 2014 Intertwingled Festival, which Ooh. celebrated the life of Ted Nelson. And uh, he said some really interesting points that really framed the problem. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what problem but at this point. I'd have to rewatch it. But um, I've been playing around with the little kinesthetic learning, like taking paper and do, creating the platonic solids. So here's an octahedron, here's a dodecahedron, and uh, the 20 sided Dungeons and Dragon dice, <laughs> the isosahedron. And you can tell a whole story from those five things, like why only five? And then how did it start with Pythagoras? And uh, so what I'm doing is uh, I'm waiting for an in my mind an episode to come together and I started my own YouTube show called the DZ Easy Show which is uh, the distributed uh, zigzag um, ZZ structure yeah Bucky Fuller too uh -huh. so I'm gonna paste the playlist so Jerry could put it in his brain and there's one episode out there now and I'm thinking about the second one so yeah we'll see where this goes uh, yeah, I mean, while the world is doing its thing, I have my little cocoon here to grow and uh, see where I emerge. Thanks. I'm curious, Eric, what, what brought about the interest in um, doing the, mm -hmm. the platonic solids? Well, they appeared in several places uh, in my life, uh, just uh, references to them. And one interesting one is um, Descartes and Leibniz. So Descartes had a secret notebook that uh, he figured out a property of the platonic solids and he was so afraid to share it at the time. And then Leibniz, that notebook has a history, like it was in a shipwreck, but somehow Leibniz got access to it and found that uh, theory that Descartes came up with, which he, it, he could have started topology if it had gone, if it had been found. Fascinating, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, John Kelly. Uh, sorry, uh, Grace, Grace, Grace yeah. and then John. So uh, yeah, the reason that I'm, my time is all messed up is because the car that I shared with my neighbors broke down and now I'm in the process of trying to find another car, but I do not have mastery of the bus schedule and I had to convince the pizza <laughs> guy to give me a ride. And anyway, my whole day went off, but, and that happens every day now. Um, <laughs> but, um, Things have been going really well on a number of my projects and one of them is a little bit stuck. So um, I'm gonna be putting out a how to Dow book this year. I've got a few chapters written. I've got a schedule and I have a committed, uh, an accountability buddy who makes me write a chapter a week. So that's going great. Yeah, they are a nice piece of guys. Um, and uh, the, uh, and the um, so that's moving forward. Um, and I just put out a DAO initial, um, initial conditions templates that people can download from my website and really think about why am I doing a DAO and what do I want my DAO to do? And so that's kind of, that's good. And I, um, enough interest came up again that I'm going to be running my future ain't what it used to be workshop, which any of you are certainly welcome to do. It's basically a six week workshop. We talk about money and value and democracy and different stuff that's coming up and how to rethink the future. So, um, and and the the DAO workshop is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's called the future I want to be. So it's about money and, and DAOs and decentralization, but really it's a reverse classroom. So I give assignments for people to read. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's at my website, DAOleadership.com. All those things are DAOleadership.com. And, um, um, and I'll put it in the chat after I speak. And so the future course is reverse classroom. So it's basically a bunch of cool people coming together for two hours every week for six weeks, talking about these topics with some guidance from the specific materials. And it, it's a particular arc, but um, 
yeah, it's awesome. And I, every time I run it, I say, this is the last time. And then like a year passes and a lot of people are interested and I do it again. Um, and the first assignment is, is that you have to deal with the fact that it's pay what you think it's worth at any time, beginning, the end, the middle, never. And so part of the assignment is really also exploring your own attitudes around money. And what does that even mean? Like, what is it worth? So it's fun um, and love to have some of you guys around for that. The other project I've been working on is this game with the eco villages around a reputation economy, a non monetary reputational economy. Thank you, Klaus. Um, and that's a little bit stuck in getting responses from the people I want to participate in the eco villages. We had a very, very successful design sprint and came up with some really interesting stuff. And the IT manager of the eco village network is involved in that. Um, and I really want to make a trip to some of these villages and cooperatives, but that's a little bit stuck in terms of actually getting people to say, yeah, I'm ready to have a visitor or whatever. So um, hopefully I'll be moving that forward after the holidays. Um, and that's super exciting. Like I was really, really pleased with the outcome from our design sprint and how well that went and how it really seemed like there's a tremendous amount of potential for a reputation based economy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's like a lot of stuff is going around, going, going well. And I just wanted to say on this thing about coordination, like the human coordination and like, why aren't we like fish? And this is kind of a weird story, I guess, like it feels out of context because like four people have spoken since we talked about that particular topic. But there's this topic about, that's really funny, Stacy was talking about something having to like explode and break down until something new happens. And I'm like, well, I did that. I exploded and some people came out and you know, like all that. And so, um, and you know, and that gave me a new life and them a new life. So that's interesting. Like that's an interesting frame to put it in, right? Like it's not necessarily a bad breakdown. Um, but also on that topic, I mean, I think women are very coordinated. And I know that when the vaccines came out, a lot of women skipped their periods. And then so did I, and so did some other people who I knew. And it was like all this big one, big coordinated efforts. And even women who hadn't gotten vaccinated told me that they felt the same disturbance. And so there is this kind of coordination. And those of us who don't use um, chemical birth control tend to coordinate with the moon. So those things are actually happening, but it's a little bit like, oh, we don't talk about that. So um, in some ways, I, I have a very strong sense of that on a general basis, but it looks really different um, maybe than the way you're imagining it, like, are we looking at each other? And, and one of you guys um, referred to that, like smelling and breathing and all these different things. So that was really interesting. That kind of touched me in that way. So that's complete. Thanks, Grace. <clears throat> interesting stuff. You know, you, you make me think, I think a lot of what we're, we take for granted around systems need to break down comes from male domination in the systems. And maybe if there were more women in the systems, we wouldn't need to have quite as violent a breakdown. Maybe there'd be an easier transition, just kind of floating that out there. Um, as the dilemma says- I would not says, argue with that at all. As the dilemma says, the future is female, you know? So, um, okay, let's go to John and then Mila. And Gil, you have not gone yet, have you? Okay. Yeah. Hey. Um... I'm not going to try to do a whole year thing. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I have what many people have talked about where you look around you and you see disaster, but you personally are doing okay. And that's an interesting thing to integrate and, and, you know, check in with your empathy, all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to bring up one little minor incident that relates to uh, uh, a sub issue. Well, actually, we, I don't think I, I had to go away for a second. So th I don't think this issue has come up in quite a while. It's an implicit issue in uh, in Grace's work with Dow, because the issue is, well, let me tell you the story. First of all, I am an appreciator and user of Clubhouse. We're doing we move serious conversations to Clubhouse. It worked, you know, it's kind of working and it's kind of working better than we thought it would on Clubhouse. But the stuff I really, I mean, I like Sirius Khan on Slubhouse. I, I really like the tech news around the world, which comes on in the morning. There's some brilliant people, you know, Australian psychologist who, who uh, you know, talks about 
narcissism and, and you know, finding how, how pre prevalent it is and how to work with it. And I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff, but there's a whole conversation going on that says Clubhouse is dying. And here's what that's about. Uh, I guess sometime in the past, uh, Twitter offered the Clubhouse folks $4 billion to just buy Clubhouse and, and run it as a Twitter thing. And mm -hmm. they said no. And they went and got $4 billion of funding, you know, startup funding. And um, the, the common understanding is now the price would have to be much, much, much lower. Why? Well, different theories about this. But I mean, the, what happened, you know, the pandemic dipped and, you know, new users dipped. But one of the things that's pretty clear that happened is you open the door, you open it. It's not iPhones only. It's, it's any, any phone and it's anybody. You don't need a special invitation. And what happened is the dominant rooms in the hallway, you know, were all about, hey, get more followers. Hey, get more money. Hey, get into Bitcoin. Hey, you know, do you understand crypto? No, 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 no you know. And it basically junk. It, it basically turned into, um, you know, what we used to see late night on UHF TV. I mean, <laughs> that just sort of came in and, and, and took over. Now, the, some of the good stuff is still there. Uh, Tech News is, is hedging. They're, they're running on, on Twitter spaces and Clubhouse simultaneously so they can slide over if they decide uh, Clubhouse isn't, isn't quite doing what it, it needs to do. But the underlying issue for us and the underlying issue that relates to all efforts to cooperate is the role of either natural or engineered scarcity. And, and you know, putting, putting a barrier up and saying, well, you know, not everybody can do this. You know, that, that triggers a lot of stuff, you know, because it was certainly abused in the past. It was certainly something that maintained uh, historic hierarchies that did had no justifiable basis for being a hierarchy in, in the, other than the fact that they got there first and they locked up the resources, you know? So the, the reaction against old hierarchies perpetuating themselves, you know, is a, is a, is a natural kind of, there's a natural kind of rebellion against that um, and to open things up. But Clubhouse is an interesting case study of if you open it up and, and it's too easy to to come in and have a platform, then you know it's it's I think it was called Gresham's law in economics. You know that the cheap currency drives out the the, the uh, valuable currency, and that seems to have happened uh, or be happening. Uh, it, they could recover. They could come back. I hope. I kind of hope they do. But the bigger question for us, as part of the whole conversation about cooperation, as part of the whole conversation about new forms of organization and part of the conversation about DAOs is how do you do this? How do you have a less, uh, you know, how do you have a positive hierarchy or, or you know, you make, make your peace with hierarchy, figure out how that's gonna work, figure out how it gets defined um, and, and um, implement it, you know, that's the challenge and, um, you know, this is it's I, we're, it's this is a good group to be thinking about it, and and uh, Grace has obviously been thinking about it a lot more, and I, I want to take that course to see how that works. Uh, but that's an op that's a subject I'm going to be working on uh, going forward. Thank you. Thanks, John. Julian, welcome. We'll get to you in a minute, um, Mila, and then Gil. I haven't been on these on these meetings for a while because I can only actually attend once a year when it's downtime because the time slot um, gets really uh, heavy with schedules and meetings. Um, so what's the question, Ken? Is it just- It's just a check-in, whatever you'd like to share with us. And it's lovely to see you. It's been a while, nice to see your yeah, face again. It's been a while. Um, yeah, so probably following on what Grace um, is working on um, and Grace, I, I know some of the Gen people in um, the Gen International. So we're actually talking about um, cryptocurrency and what kind of tokens would Gen be working with. Um, so if you'd like to, we're having regular meetings to talk about that. And, um, 
cryptocurrency platforms like seeds and other cryptocurrencies. So not that I'm heavy into it, it's just being pulled into ecosystem collaboration. So what I've been um, doing for the last year is really a lot of collaborations that is moving away from self-interest and you know projects and individual institutions, but actually coming together, not as strategic partnerships, but really like cellular collaboration, like an ecosystem, miscellaneous, human miscellaneous collaboration. So that each one depends on each other to actually produce benefits to the ecosystem that we, we sit in and belong to, as well as the ecosystem that we serve together. Think like if we were the heart, the heart doesn't need to be the liver or the kidney, um, but the heart needs to function with the liver and the kidney and all the other organs to serve a greater purpose, which is making the body healthy because then all the organs would die. So how do we then show that up experiment in real terms and decentralized um, distributed infrastructures are part of that. And so I've been working with institutions, not just talking about it, actually manifesting collaborations, various different institutions, as well as grassroots communities, bioregional communities in Latin America and South America, uh, South Africa, um, coming together and coming together, looking at practices, complex systems, um, and how to work together as a community and working with all these different frameworks and experimenting as an ecosystem. And also then there's the whole funding. Um, so we're talking to impact investors who's looking, venture capitalists who's looking at different ways of funding and really looking at funding an ecosystem rather than particular projects, particular initiatives, particular institutions. So moving away from this, um, you know, silo kind of mentality, but coming together really more like aligned to life and nature, which is fundamentally my life purpose. And how do we experiment doing that more and more? So it's manifesting before my eyes at the moment. And um, there seems to be a real consciousness of moving towards um, this distributed infrastructure and the scale is not the scale in volume. The scale is in complexity. How do we, how do we harness the flexibility and adaptability of the nodes of the nodes of the cells of a mycelium, so to speak, or networks of networks, to then be able to be flexible and adaptable to the complexity that, as we scale in a large scale framework, to just to evolve, just like life. So very much aligning to how actually life evolves. And um, a lot of these people are actually experimenting. And luckily these, the people, the institutions that we're working with are people that has been adapting and, and doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. So these are real application rather than just theory. Um, and um, Nobel Prize winners, evolutionary scientists. And so it's bringing behavioral science, indigenous wisdom, and also um, regenerative practices on the ground. Um, real, real practitioners, not just, you know, sitting there looking at theory, permaculture, biochar, all of that. So just really interesting how the consciousness have shifted within this one year. And I'm guessing there's a whole deal with the whole COVID and what's coming. And there's a lot of talk of um, we are coming ahead to something of another meltdown of uh, finance and all of the signs and the signals are showing that. So it's it's coming at a time, at, a, at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mila. Um, you'll just put a question there. How can we learn more about your work? Um, so I work very differently. I've been offered by all of these institutions to, to have roles. And I said, I, I'm moving away from roles, uh, more moving, if you can, we can co-create together a role and a remuneration that speaks of ecosystem. Then, and then I'm not like in any website or anything, I can share with you the websites that I'm working with. I'm more kind of like um, an air traffic controller <laughs> that works with many, many portfolios of projects and programs that are actually working together. And um, it's an experimentation and Grace, yes, I would, 
send you some information. I'm actually meeting with the GEN people, the international networks, as well as the funders of GEN um, at, at kind of grassroots all the way up to the board. So I work with the grassroots all the way to the board. So it's, it's decision makers, but at the same time, the operational people on the ground. And all of these people are actually gifting their work. So there isn't, and they've been funded already. So there isn't this necessity of scarcity thinking. Uh, of who gets what. Um, I think there's just this, this, this something is coming really, really like manifesting beyond just an individual human level. There's, there's a whole kind of consciousness shifting um, that I'm seeing and it's not in the mainstream. Um, the mainstream is just constantly talking about scarcity and fear and all that, but there's a whole lot of abundance and a whole lot of movement in the space of the pioneering stages. And there are just some amazing stuff that people are doing. I, I just wish that there was some kind of platform that we can all look at rather than just be pulled down by so much scarcity thinking and fear mongering. Because there are amazing people led by millennials actually that are doing this work from the cryptocurrency all the way to institutions. One of them is pro-social. Have a look. They're um, Nobel Prize winner, evolutionary scientists, behavioral scientists coming together. They've been around since 2000. They've actually mitigated the Ebola uh, when it came around 2014. And it's, it's what I think some of you talked about collaboration, conflict management based on observation, not based on a co-created uh, design. It was based on observing, observing how people collaborated around the world including indigenous peoples, corporations, and they pull together principles and, and uh, ways of collaborating that has stood the test of time for many, many generations. And I didn't even know about them. It just came into my purview in August um, and they're gifting it to the world at local level, um, grassroots level and doing community field research to basically arm grassroots to do their own collaboration. Um, and translating into their own language and wisdom and culture. So it's amazing. I'm just really, I, I just, I can't wait for early next year, Ken, and also working with you in, on the work. So it's, it's evolving as we speak. So it's not something that is just being talked about, it's actually manifesting and actually the collaborations are actually happening. Perfect, Gil, you wanna just ask directly? Sorry. Uh, uh, what, 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 is G, what is Jen? Jen is, um, sorry, it's Global Eco Village Network that Grace right. talked about. Yeah. So, I, knew, I, knew, I knew that. <laughs> okay. so I've been working with them. I've been working with the founders of cryptocurrency platforms, mostly with the founders. So the founders of Human System Dynamics um, that looks at complex system from human perspective and pro-social founders, as well as the Regenesis, which is, uh, they've been around for 30, 40 years doing story of place, doing regenerative practices across the world. So these people are coming together with a cryptocurrency platform. So it's quite an interesting old theories and new theories and indigenous peoples coming together. Yeah. Is Robert Gilman involved in that? Robert, no. Gilman? Not, not so far that I know of, but there's so many constellations of these people coming together. It's, it's really difficult to, to keep up with it, you know? And it's just people forming together consciously and really wanting and like with pro-social they already have the funding from uh, trust and foundation so they're gifting it to people so there's not the scarcity of how many how much money you need to you know how do you get a job etc sorry klaus and i will respond later on the chat thank you Mila. No, I, uh, we just got accepted as a uh, the uhub the present from uh, the presencing institute for this Palouse project um, and there are about 60 indigenous tribes living within that larger region, which mm -hmm. we definitely need to include into, into our body of work. In, yeah. in the, community. Um, the challenge is, and, and they are, I've been exposed to some amazing organizations that are, that are focusing on, on change, you know, uh, American sustainability business movement and so on. So the, 
the, the challenge really is to translate that into an operational frame. You know? okay. and, and so, so you know, Donald Meadows, the hierarchy of you know, the, the interventions, the, the, we, we are doing really good at the narrative level. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and we are even doing really good at bringing the narrative down to the next storyline. But as you go deeper then into, into the uh, society, so to speak, you, you're now dealing with more administrative things that need to take place in order to operationalize these narratives that, are, that have formed already. Now, so that's what I'm working in this space of translating into operation. Now. And it's extremely difficult to uh, uh, to 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 make that work. And it's uh, so so that, that's where I was, you know, coming into the how do you how do you make the narrative the authority, right? So I think that's sort of how do you make the narrative the authority so that governs our structures, you know, the distributed uh, independent networks and so on still have to follow. A common thresh, a common thought, you know, a, a common direction. And so um, the the formation of these collaborations. So the one in South Africa, they have two hundred and twenty two indigenous communities, and they're trying to. Um, they have land over I don't know how many hectares of land that they want to congregate and collaborate. And the key thing is how do they govern, right? And how do they actually collaborate at cellular level? So there's something called story of place. So it, the story of place is the bio expression, not only of the context of the historical, but also the watershed, the bio regional expression that people come to together and remembering of history of centuries of how that region was placed and how the culture was formed around that. And story of place has been around for 30, 40 years. And if you look at regional assist group, they've been doing this across the world. And that's how you bring a whole multiple stakeholders coming together from a place of potential, not a place of problem solving. And it is a story. It is a story of place that is co-created. So the people who comes, they're just, they work in the shadows. They arm the, the, the leaders, the influencers of that community with the culture and the wisdom of that community. So there's a lot of community engagement at the beginning. The whole focus of eco villages and regionalist group is basically to focus on the culture and the social transformation first. There's a lot of inner work as well as the you know U Lab also talks about the cultivation of the intervener. It highly depends on the cultivation or the cultivation of a change is highly depends on the cultivation of the intervener. So this is the same thing, but it's based on application for decades. It's 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 something that they've done. And they constantly evolve with, with, with what is manifesting in real time. So these people, I've brought them together, Regenesis Group, Ho Social, does it beautifully to collaborate people, not only from a purpose and values, but also psychological flexibility based on behavioral science, evolutionary science, and behavioral economics. And how they do it is they, they demonstrate the system to be visible unto itself, including what are the shadows that prevent them? So Robert Keegan's work, which is competing commitments. And it's, it's very much made visible as a structure. And with the Regenesis group, they take about four months just to do focus on the community engagement, to come together, to really come together with a story that brings them together. And this is some of the indigenous um, wisdom. Because when you look at indigenous wisdom, the whole culture and ethics and the fabric of their life is transferred through the storytelling. And it's not just storytelling of humanity, sometimes about animals, but within that, there's such a story that inspires, motivates. And it's, it's about regenerative. How can it constantly breathe new life in the collaboration, in the motivation, in keeping the motivation through the direction of travel? And so it's beyond just the, the head, it's, it's understanding living system within that place. And that consists of human is just one part of it. There is the whole system, the history, the culture, the bioregion, the geography, and understand that as a place to be proud, to be part of how it evolves over time beyond the involvement of the people in the project. 
So how do you integrate it so you give self-agency to that community to, to bring their own wisdom and their own culture and their own story? Um, and that is some of the collaboration that's happening right now. And then arm them with complex systems. And you talked about, Klaus, how do you do this? Well, you do it one experiment at a time as a group, as a collaborator. And, and the people who are bringing the expertise, they're in the background. They're not the ones leading it. They're just training the people to, to then translate it in their own language, in their own wisdom, in their own culture. And they experiment one bit of it then it informs the next experiment. So what we're creating is adaptive action labs, regenerative action labs. So you're learning from the experimentation and it will be a constant experimentation of, of evolution. So it's not this 10 year plan. It's literally an experimentation of what that informs the next. Um, and we, we're doing it very differently. And it's similar to cryptocurrency and DAOs is all about you know, how do you experiment? What does this look like? Because one DAO or one particular culture or one particular group may be very different to another. So it's, it's being very uh, focused on acting locally, collaborating regionally and institutionally, and then learning from a global platform. So the whole focus is not to make those projects to be successful as an ecosystem, it's to learn for them to make tons of mistakes and tons of experimentation and have a global platform where that resides as an archive and an artifact. And then it can be, become a NFT, it can be an artifact of a culture. There's a whole movement of different things happening and experimenting at the moment from the technology part and also going back to the roots of acting locally and empowering local nodes to be flexible and adaptable to be able to scale. So not from a volume perspective, but from a flexibility, adaptability, and complex to complexity as they evolve. Does that kind of give you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate this. We may, we may end up calling on you to uh, <laughs> get us launched there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, and you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, uh, coming from a corporate environment where you know you get, you get put in charge and you issue uh, directives on here's what we're going to do and so to translate you know the the impulses that that i have to make stuff work right because i know exactly how this needs to move in order to work from an operational perspective but to translate that through um, uh, uh, people who need to who need to feel it right i mean they need to to understand and understand it and on a really deep level, why this is uh, what we need to do. That's a huge challenge. I mean, you know, for, uh, for me to completely rethink the way you know, I function and, and have um, in my life experiences. Hey, thank you. Gil, over to you. Yeah, wow. Give me a minute to absorb. Okay. Sorry, I don't have a brain to share. So, you know, just uh, <laughs> there's no in, there's no. Uh, no, no stage patter. Just go right to you. Thanks. Um, Mila, that was extraordinarily rich. Thank you. I, I haven't heard from you before, so I'm delighted to meet you. Um, and I'm really grateful for the mood that you've evoked in me by what you've shared. So thank you for that. Um, I know the Regenesis folks, uh, business partner with, partners with one of them for many years and have uh, watched their work and brought them in on projects. Um, and um, it's a remarkable phenomenon because it, it, it's, I find it very hard to explain to civilians. It sounds kind of too weird and slow and expensive and upset, uh, but I've seen just stunning shifts that happen in a community uh, in this work. So I'm delighted to know about that. Um, golly, so many things. Um, John, back to what you said about, about natural barrier. To me, the most significant natural barrier lately is time. Um, and I was you know, intrigued by Clubhouse when it showed up and very quickly realized that I didn't want to spend most of my time listening to people talking. Um, and I found the dynamics of it really unsatisfying compared to the dynamics of this, which is also not, you know, not all of what we want. Uh, but that richness of interactivity, um, 
I just find lacking there, uh, thought about building, building out a platform there, not a hypey one, as you talked about, but a substantive one. It just didn't seem worth the effort um, to do that, uh, to find productive community and interaction. So Stuart, I'm with you. I'm, I love these kind of conversations. I mean, I think four groups like this every week or every other week. Uh, it's a substantial investment of time. Uh, I can't point directly to what comes of it, uh, but I feel profoundly nourished and shaped by these conversations. Uh, uh, this one here, um, the, um, the power and wisdom work with Fernando Flores that I've mentioned a number of times, um, the mobilized conversations with Chauncey Bell, um, and the monthly Living Between Worlds conversations that I've been posting for now almost two years, um, trying to figure out what to do with that. Uh, this has been, um, this last couple of years has felt a lot like treading water. Uh, part of that was just dealing with burnout coming out of the, uh, the Palo Alto gig. Uh, part of that's been dealing with, uh, with, with Jane's health issues uh, as kind of a central focus of our lives and some health issues I've been dealing with and, uh, and pandemic mind, which a lot of us have talked about. It's been very hard to find focus uh, and, and, and steady, um, well, steady focus on a particular thing. Um, partly the mood of pandemic, partly my kind of inveterate interest in lots of different things at the same time. And I'm learning, you know, trying to learn how to narrow that field down. And the, the news report of the last month or so is, um, is uh, I feel like my mojo is back. I feel like my focus is back. Uh, I feel, um, this, I, I say feel, because I feel this in my body. I feel like I'm showing up in my body in a different way uh, every day. Um, and what that looks like from the outside is um, um, well, one of the things I've been thinking about doing is, is building a learning platform, building a kind of academy for the for the transition. And I'm finding there are so many people doing that in so many different ways. That's not territory for me to go into. I'll continue to host the monthly calls. Um, there may be some gentle spin-offs from that, but that's not going to be a focus as in developing a line of business. Uh, what is, um, is a project that I've been attempting to um, say no thank you to and put down for about 10 years for various reasons that I can't do this for reason X or reason Y. And lately it's been because it just feels too big. Uh, but I, I, I finally surrendered. And my friend Tim says, don't fight the feeling. Uh, and so I, it looks like I'm now in the business of creating investment funds with a very particular focus uh, to, um, to leverage what I've learned about the, um, these old words, what we used to call sustainability in business, which we don't know what we're calling it yet. Uh, I think it's something like, how do we do business as if we belonged to the living world? just to not euphemize about it anymore. And so I'm looking at, at building three funds. One is um, to work with the, the new world of startups of regenerative climate finance, decentralized organization and so forth, which are accessible mostly to accredited investors and make those available to retail investors. So both help move money into supporting the new work and help more people participate in it financially rather than just let it be a way for rich people to get richer. So that's number one. And number two, the very different focus is not on the startup universe, but on the, the existing universe of the middle market of the hundreds of thousands or millions of companies that do the regular stuff of every day, you know, from bakeries to machine shops to nail salons to builders to lumber yards to, um, um, you know, small manufacturers and so forth, who are mostly have not been in this game. We don't have R&D organizations or budgets. Uh, who are often in the supply chains of the big companies being told they need to do something about climate, but don't know where and what to do. Um, hundreds of thousands of these companies in the middle market in the U.S. are owned by aging founders, people who look like this, who are near retirement and may not have families uh, to deed the company to. Um, 
I, I have a I have a speculation that a lot of these companies are socially responsible in the very old sense of being kind of the anchor of a community and the source of most of the jobs in the community and the source of most of the philanthropy in the community, giving jobs to people who live there. Uh, and so place becomes very important in you know sort of a parallel way to what Mila has been talking about. So the notion is to um, uh, invest in these firms. Uh, help them rapidly adapt to the realities of climate and the changing world, which is, by the way, profitable as well as purpose um, driving. Um, 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 bring in the kinds of management capabilities that we've been talking about in these calls for the last couple of years, the transparency and participation and flatness and so forth, build the capacity of the people who work there and then exit not by IPO and not by selling to uh, a, a private equity fund, but by transition to a worker-owned company owned by the people who live in the community rooted in place um, and positioned for the future that we're living into. Uh, so I've never done this before. <laughs> I've, got, um, built, I've got a team of people who've done pieces of it. And um, um, so I'm off on an adventure. Uh, to see what that looks like. Um, and um, things have been moving very fast this last week. I will keep you posted as it becomes more substantive. I very much want to, I've, I've had a funny relationship with crypto over all these years. Uh, the blockchain made sense to me immediately. Cryptocurrencies did not. I'm wary of the Ponzi nature. Uh, of, a, of, of, of a lot of, of, of what I, uh, of how I interpret a lot of what's going on. Uh, but DAOs are talking to me and I need to get more immersed in that world, understand how it works, what role that could have in the kind of game I'm trying to build. Um, um, and the other element to this, uh, you know, we, we, there's been several conversations about scale through, through, through the morning um, and uh, Scale happens in two ways. The Silicon Valley talks about the scale of the hockey stick, be a billion dollar company in no time at all, clubhouse $4 billion out of thin air. So there's, there's that vertical scale of the hockey stick. There's also the horizontal scale of what I think of as the federated small. How do we stitch together small enterprises and small initiatives around the world to build a kind of power and capability network uh, uh, rather than traditional hierarchies? Uh, so. That's what's going on. Um, on the health front, Jane is on a new treatment regime for her cancers and seems to be doing better. Oncologist is cautiously optimistic. Uh, so that's been a sense of relief for both of us in this house. We'll see how that goes. Uh, it's a wild card uh, in everything I do. I've, 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 I've been weary of, of a new entrepreneurial venture because of the uncertainty of that, but given the uncertainty of everything, like we were talking about earlier on this call, it's like, what the fuck? Let's go. Let's do, what we do. you know, dan dance as circumstances change and uh, move it forward. So that's uh, that's where I am at the moment. Thanks, Gil. Does anybody have a hard stop in two minutes? Do we have time to actually stay on and, and listen to Julian? Ross, you have to go. Anybody else? Mila. Okay. Um, so the rest of us can stay. Julian, we want to definitely want to hear from you. Grace, you had your hand raised for a minute there. Did you want to speak quickly or? Yes, Mila, could you put your contact info in the chat if you're willing to, or somehow how to get in touch with you? Thank sure. You. Um, Jeff, Sorry, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, I can't even speak at the moment. Um, Jerry knows me well, so I'll, I'll put that in. Okay. So if you need to get a hold of me, Jerry knows, and Kendall knows me. Great. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say something about some of the stuff that Gil was doing, but there's so there are like eight different things I want to say to you about that, Gil, and some people I want to introduce you to. So I'll take that offline with you. Great. Thanks, Rick. Julian, welcome. Good uh, morning. I was going to say, excuse me for being late. I was dealing with a combination of a dead computer and a kitten who can't go outside because of the weather, so he's taking it out by being rambunctious inside just seems to have settled down right a few seconds ago. Um, my check-in is on a quite different tack because uh, I'm actually building software. Recently, I updated my VebRain exporter to handle VebRain 12 
uh, files. And this allows me to interface to the Neo4j graph database, well, any graph database, and actually, and then also my own um, knowledge base visualizer. So what I'm working on now that that's working, I'm trying to implement my knowledge base management system on Google Cardboard, uh, Tilt 5, and then a VR headset with the eventual goal of not to have this running as a product on these, but to form a research base for how you would manage knowledge if it was something you could literally put your hands on. So th that is uh, what I'm going to be doing by the end of the year. And Gil's got a question for you about the brain and obsidian. It's in the chat. Yeah. Um, Hi, Mila. Uh, I don't know. Does Obsidian handle JSON import? I don't know. You know, it would it would take some work if they don't handle JSON or GraphML. Then it would it take some work, but it, theoretically, it's possible. Yeah. Um, you know, Pete Kaminsky probably knows the answers. All right. Well, that wraps our call for the day. It's really great to see everybody. I wish you all. Uh, a great new year, happy solstice, Merry Christmas if you're celebrating Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, happy new year, all that good stuff. Um, I think we have one more call next week. Uh, I'll let Jerry confirm that, but I seem to hear him recall him saying that next week's our last call. So I have no idea what that'll be about, but um, it just, I want to say my appreciation to each and every one of you. It's been just a pleasure to hang out with you these last couple of years online here and I've learned so much and um, I just want to keep that going, so. Good. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe.